Finally, we're going to talk about inhibition, which is based on the effects of the inhibitory interneurons, which we have not talked about since the start. In the brain, neurons are either excitatory or inhibitory, but not both. This is different from most artificial neural network models, which typically have synaptic weights that can be both positive and negative on the same individual neuron or unit in the models. Um, whereas in the brain, if you're a particular type of neuron, you can only send excitation through releasing glutamate, interacting with AMPA channels, or inhibition, sending GABA as the inhibitory neurotransmitter acting on GABA channels. Here, what we're going to do is go through the biology and sort of understand how these inhibitory effects work, and then we'll see how we can summarize them using equations. So the effects of inhibition are essentially to produce competition, which works very much as in Darwinian evolutionary theory. You have a survival of the fittest kind of dynamic. Uh, this competition for who is going to get active in the case of the brain, so which neurons are going to get the chance to be active and represent the current information that's currently coming in. The neurons that get the most amount of excitation and are able to fire earliest and strongest essentially outcompete the neurons that don't get as much excitation. And we're going to see in the next chapter how that competitive dynamic interacts with learning. Uh, the overall summary term of these things, description of these dynamics, is producing something called sparse distributed representations. Uh, this sparseness refers to the fact that relatively few neurons are active at any given moment in time, um, but yet you still have this key property of distributed representation. Fewer than, for example, in many artificial neural network models, typically about 15% of neurons are active at any given point in the brain. And so that's the level of sparseness that we're talking about. There are two qualitatively different types of inhibition, feed forward and feedback. And it's a little bit tricky to understand because it's not about how the inhibition connects to the excitatory neurons, but rather how the inhibition itself is being driven. So in feedback inhibition, the inhibition, the inhibitory interneurons, are being driven directly from the population of excitatory neurons that they then project inhibit inhibition back to. So this kind of red circle indicates GABAergic inhibitory projections that activate those GABA ion channels, allowing chloride ions into these excitatory neurons, these pyramidal cells, and that causes them to be inhibited. And so if you have this feedback inhibition, it's the direct uh, activity levels of neurons that these inhibitory neurons are themselves inhibiting that uh, is driving inhibition. And that's directly a negative feedback loop. This is like having an air conditioner that's measuring the temperature of the room. That's the sensor here. The uh, level of excitation is essentially the sensor telling the inhi inhibitory air conditioner how hot the room is, how much activation there is in the room, and then it delivers an amount of inhibition or cooling directly kind of in proportion to that amount of heat. In contrast, uh, for feed-forward inhibition, uh, the inhibitory neurons are being driven by the inputs that are also projecting into the excitatory layer. And the critical feature here is that it allows the inhibition to anticipate the incoming levels of excitation and send a proportional amount of inhibition to these same neurons that essentially anticipates the level of excitation that they're going to be receiving. So this is like uh, smart thermostats that are controlling AC units these days um, that uh, look at the weather forecast and determine how much uh, inhibition to drive as a function of what the actual temperature is outside.